What are the biggest problems with AMA discharges or discharges against medical advice? There are basically two main problems. One of them centers around actually doing the discharge and a lot of common misconceptions that are there about if patients can leave AMA and what we can provide them with when they are discharged. Is their ins insurance going to cover their discharge and hospital stay, things like that. And the second problem, and one I'm actually more curious about in terms of your opinion, is should we even be doing AMA discharges in general, or should we just be letting patients leave um, and you know do it as a formal you know standard discharge? So these are some things I'm going to address today in this video. First, let's talk about some common uh, misconceptions about AMA discharges. So one of them I remember as an intern is uh, thinking that patients who left AMA would potentially not be able to get their hospital stay covered by insurance. And this is very frequently handed down from attendings to residents to the interns. It just becomes this kind of perpetuating uh, cycle of misinformation. But there's actually no evidence to suggest that insurance uh, companies will not cover patients' stay if they leave against medical advice. So here you can see the financial responsibility of hospitalized patients who left against medical advice. Medical urban legend? So patients frequently counsel patients who leave against medical advice that insurance will not pay for their care. However, it is unclear whether insurers deny payment for hospitalization in these cases. Uh, so in this cohort, retrospective cohort study uh, from patients from 2001 to 2010, uh, they sampled and found 500 or 1% of patients who left AMA. Uh, among insured patients, payment was refused in 4.1% of cases. But reasons for refusal were largely administrative, such as the wrong name or other problems with their insurance, and no cases of payment refusal were because uh, patients left AMA. Nevertheless, most residents, 68%, and nearly half of attendings believed insurance denies payment when a patient leaves AMA. So since there's no clear actual problem with leaving AMA in terms of an uh, insurance standpoint, uh, what, it, what this has instead become for patients is kind of like a coercive tactic to convince them to stay in the hospital. And it's something that we should not really propagate moving forward. The second misconception, and I haven't experienced this one quite as often as the previous one I talked about, but there is sometimes a misconception that if a patient leaves AMA, we can't send them with their medications because they're going against our medical advice. To the contrary, we actually should be providing all of the medications that we think they'll need and will benefit from on discharge. And also we should set them up with as much follow-up and as close of follow-up as possible. So you really should think about it as trying to get the patient as set up for success as possible, despite the fact that they're leaving against medical advice. This is something that really only happened kind of in my intern year. I remember a few times where I was told I shouldn't be sending the patients home with medications. But nowadays when I discharge somebody against medical advice, I will always prescribe them medications and at least uh, you know, give them a sufficient amount until they can get to their follow-up PCP appointment. And then finally, the last kind of mistake I'd say with doing AMA discharges is sometimes uh, we really do try a little too hard to try and make patients stay. And it becomes this thing where we're stigmatizing the patient or blaming the patient for having other reasons for leaving. Really, when you're doing an AMA discharge, it should be a fairly simple process. You need to go talk with the patient and have a formal risks and benefit discussion and then make sure they have a clear understanding of why they're in the hospital and what the risks of leaving the hospital early are and then that they have you know a reasonable um, kind of reason for why they want to leave the hospital if they ha meet all that criteria and you feel that they have capacity to make that decision then they can totally they're totally free to make their decision to leave the hospital a lot of times patients really do have real reasons that they need to leave the hospital, whether it be financial or family related. Honestly, in, the, in these situations, just let your patients leave and just absolutely do your best to set them up with the right medications they need and the close follow-up that they need on discharge. So the second big problems with AMA discharges, and I'm definitely curious about your guys' opinions of this, uh, but it's whether we should really be doing AMA discharges at all. And this is not something that I ever really questioned until recently. I had an attending who basically said he doesn't do AMA discharges at all anymore. And then he gave me a bunch of literature citing about why AMA discharges are actually a completely useless kind of um, practice that we do. And it's just become this kind of culturally ingrained thing that we need to uh, force patients to sign these AMA uh, paperwork things before they leave. And really, if you think about it, you know, it seems the obvious reason is 
for medical legal purposes, you know, to have the patient sign this piece of paper and say it's against medical advice so that we can cover ourselves in case something bad happens to the patient. Because we do know that AMA discharges are associated with a significantly increased、uh, risk of readmission and、uh, complications and, you know, worsening of their disease process. But、uh, really, this whole formalized process of having them sign this paper and really just stigmatizing them for leaving does not show any benefits at all. So, this is another Choosing Wisely article that my attending gave me, but things we do for no reason against medical advice discharges. So, they state that from a healthcare quality perspective, the designation of a discharge as AMA is low value care in that it is a routine hospital practice without demonstrated benefit and is not supported by a strong evidence base. We argue that designating discharges as AMA has never been shown to advance patient care. And then it has the potential to harm patients by reducing access to care and promoting stigma. So, why you think AMA discharges are helpful?、Um, although there's little empirical data to inform how and why physicians choose to designate a discharge as AMA,、uh, fears of legal liability are strongly driving the practice. Many physicians may believe that they have to discharge patients AMA in order to fulfill their legal and ethical responsibilities or to demonstrate in writing. The physician's concern and the significant risk of leaving. And uh, apparently, uh, there is some Medicare hospital readmission reduction program. So you get penalized if a patient gets readmitted to the hospital soon after discharge. And that by designating it as an AMA discharge, you avoid、uh, those kinds of penalties from Medicare.、Um, and so they didn't really address this in this article. So if, if really there is some kind of penalty for getting readmissions, Uh, but that's avoided by doing AMA discharges. That almost seems like that is a strong reason to continue doing AMA discharges because it was against medical advice. So I'm not sure. I don't believe they address that in this article here. So, why AMA discharges add no value to a patient's fully informed、uh, declination of care? So, there's growing literature to demonstrate that AMA discharges stigmatize patients, reduce their access to care, and reduce the quality of informed consent decisions compared to patients discharged conventionally. 25% of patients dis- discharged AMA reported not wanting to return for follow up care. To persuade patients to remain hospitalized, 85% of trainees and 67% of attending physicians in one study incorrectly informed their patients that insurance will not reimburse a hospitalization if they leave AMA. And I, re- I remember doing this as an intern because I was told that it would not cover their hospital stay. And now I really regret because I, I remember having some prolonged conversations with some patients about this. And、uh, now I know it was just completely wrong. And then, although clinicians may presume that the AMA designation provides protection from liability, the claim is not supported by the available literature. In these studies, which reviewed relevant case law, defendants prevailed not because of the physician's AMA designation, but because the plaintiff was not able to prove negligence. The proper execution of the discharge process, not the specific designation of AMA, is what conferred. Conferred liability protection. So, in this article, they suggested that what physicians should do instead is avoiding the AMA designation and instead promote shared decision making and harm reduction. Because all competent patients have the right to decline recommended inpatient treatment, the ethical and legal、uh, standard for the physician is that the physician obtain the patient's informed consent by, to leave by communicating the risks, benefits, and alternatives to leaving. And fully documenting the conversation in the medical record. The additional steps of formalizing the discharge as AMA and providing AMA forms for the patient to sign have never been demonstrated to improve quality and add needless clerical work. And I totally agree with that needless clerical work. It, it was always like an extra step that sometimes took a very, very long time. But as long as you are having that informed consent process with the patient and you are documenting that, that is what you really legally need to do to protect yourself. When declining any treatment, even life sustaining treatment, The request for a patient signature to decline such treatment has not been demonstrated to improve risk communication and is not considered a best practice for informed consent. When the physician's motives for this behavior are punitive or directed primarily at reducing liability, it may distract the physician from their fiduciary duty to put patients first. The solution to improve quality is straightforward avoid designating discharges as AMA. Instead, clinicians should maintain a single discharge process with clear, objective documentation, including Providing appropriate prescriptions and follow up appointments, regardless of whether the patient's choice is consistent with a physician's recommendation. This article did note that sometimes this just might not be practical in your institution because it's an institutional practice. And so they did discuss that physicians who wish to promote stronger patient centered discharge practices may find that avoiding or limiting AMA discharges may conflict, conflict 
with their institution's policy. In those cases, physicians should work closely with their leadership and legal counsel to ensure that any proposed practice changes are legally compliant, but also improve shared decision making and reduce stigma uh, for this population. This is a final paper that uh, my attending links to me, but it's from the Annals of Internal Medicine and basically says, we believe it is time to retire the AMA designation. The terminology has been criticized as stigmatizing and non-person-centered language. Clinical documentation around AMA discharges may shape health professionals' attitudes toward patients and change clinical decision-making. Terminology places responsibility for the decision on the patient while neglecting other factors such as clinician attitudes and health system policies that might contribute to a patient leaving the hospital. Many factors influence these decisions, including undertreated withdrawal symptoms and pain, stigma, discrimination, inability to smoke, and other personal factors. And third, and perhaps the most important, the against component of the AMA designation implicitly describes an antagonistic interaction between patients and clinicians, rather than encouraging a collaborative approach to promoting patient health when these situations arrive. They actually uh, proposed changing the term from AMA, or against medical advice, to describing such discharges as before medically advised, or BMA. This terminology has several advantages. Uh, before medically advised is non-judgmental and is not antagonistic. It's also very similar to AMA. And uh, this is not really stigmatizing as uh, AMA can potentially be. All right, so what are your thoughts on not doing AMA after hearing about all those articles? Do you think you would stop uh, discharging patients AMA and making them sign all that paperwork and everything? Or are you still going to do that? For me, um, you know, before, actually, right before I was recording this video, I was like, no, I'm still going to discharge everybody AMA. Like, that's just, you know, our culture here. That's just what's the safest. And, you know, people would think it's kind of weird if you didn't discharge a patient AMA when they are leaving against medical advice. Um, but I think it is thought provoking, actually, because there is a part of me now that after reading all that, it's like, no, I could just do a standard discharge. I could say that they left before medically advised or something like that. I could document that I wanted the patient to stay longer, um, but we had a risk benefit discussion. They had informed consent and express understanding. Uh, and then they decided to leave. Uh, it's possible that maybe I should be practicing more like that. So I wonder what your thoughts are on that. Also, one last thing I wanted to address is that there are so many things that you can do uh, to prevent AMA discharges. Because a lot of AMA discharges, uh, there's a lot of literature backing that many of the patients uh, who leave AMA, they're predominantly male, uh, they're predominantly substance users. And so there are many things that we can do to actually help prevent AMA discharges or patients wanting to leave against medical advice. So first of all, you know, treating their substance use and preventing any withdrawal upfront is very, very important. So we really need to be aggressive with somebody's opioid use disorder and making sure that they're getting their opioid withdrawal symptoms treated appropriately and also offering them things like medication uh, assisted treatment. And there's also a very strong socioeconomical component to patients who want to leave AMA as well. So a lot of times they need to leave due to financial reasons or they need to leave to take care of a pet or a family member, or they have something else urgent to do at home. And so in those cases, I would recommend getting a social worker involved early so we can really figure out how we can support the patient financially or in terms of some of those socioeconomic factors early so that they feel that they have the capacity to stay in the hospital to complete their course of treatment. And then finally, uh, there is a big sense of la lack of control in a lot of patients. And so a lot of times we need to give patients more of that sense of control back. We need to have better conversations with them about their illnesses and give them a sense of control of them getting to guide and direct their own medical care. And a lot of times when we are not giving the patient uh, that kind of a feeling that they're still in control of what's going on, then one of the ways that they express that loss of control is wanting to leave AMA. And so it's kind of like a cry for help in that sense. So we can do a better job communicating with patients and just meeting them uh, at the same level and make them not feel like they want to leave against medical advice. Thanks again for watching. I'll see you in the next video and peace.